Bring down a few of the uh, items I use for the making of these works, um, just to show you. Um, because there's certain sort of papers, certain sort of pens, things like that. So I know there's a few practicing artists here, and people that aren't practicing artists might be interested anyway. Um, the paper I use for all of these works here, except this big one, uh, is a Zalana paper. And uh, you can get various watercolour papers that you might like to use. Some people like to use uh, what's called a hot pressed paper, and some people like to use what's called a cold pressed paper. Um, the cold pressed paper seems to have much more of a texture on it, whereas the hot pressed one obviously gets pressed under um, hot um, pressure and it is very smooth normally. Uh, so this is a hot pressed paper. It's a 300 GSM, which is 300 grams per square metre, is that right? 300 grams per square metre. Um, so it's a heavy paper. Um, I put in the pad, the type of pad that I use. Um, these pads come in various sizes. Um, you get a front uh, size, and then you can get a larger one, uh, like the ones you have there um, in the end. So, um, the larger pad is a fairly big one to carry around, and I just normally have a, one of those camping seats and sit in the seat, but not get in the seat. And I have a little uh, box or a, one of those plastic crates, and I use that to put the water on and the water colours and things like that. Um, so if you want to just pass that around, you can feel how smooth that paper is. It is very smooth, so it doesn't have the sort of dimpling in it that you get with a, um, you know, a lot of watercolour paper. And also, people uh, who have done watercolours often stretch the watercolour papers. Uh, I don't tend to do that, I just tend to use them in the block. You can stretch them, you can tape around them, and uh, you get it as tight as a drum. Um, so that's what I like to do. The reason I like to use those pads is because they've, they've got their own base, so you can just carry them anywhere, sit in the seat. They get a bit wobbly when, when they get down to the last few papers. But generally, it's a really good paper. The other thing about the paper that I really like is you can actually scrub into it as well. And by that I mean you can uh, you can use this like a, I use a little stuff of a bristle paintbrush, like a bulky bristle paintbrush, that you use for oil painting or something like that. And I cut the bristles off, so I've just got little stubs of bristles, and with a bit of water, I can scrub back into the work when I'm when I'm actually working on it. So an example of that would be in this one here, if you look at the, the line at the front, which you can see from there is, is a, a brown, a strongish brown line. The line at the back is quite a light brown line, very pale. It's exactly the same line, except this one has been scrubbed back with the stuff, the stuff of the brush from the water. And it leaves a remnant of the, the, the mark you put down first. You also, when you when you work back in, when I work back into the uh, ink, it also uh, forms a wash, like a watercolour wash. So certain um, certain images here are just basically uh, like a, <coughs> a pen line, and then uh, with, a, with a bit of water, I wash back into it. So a lot of the um, a lot of the washes in this are just to wash down the pen. Um, so the pen I use is, this is my favourite pen. Um, this is a little fountain pen. It's called a sailor pen. It's made by a company called Chilano. And Chilano make, um, they're owned by uh, a Japanese master, master pen maker, <coughs> and, you know, Mr. Yamamoto, or whatever. And uh, he, um, he grinds the nibs, so if you order a special pen, uh, not that one, but another pen I ordered, I had to wait for three months for the pen to be nib to be ground by the master pen maker because he um, is the only one who is allowed to grind the nibs apparently. Um, the problem with the, the other one I got, which I was wanting the finest pen I could get, and they said I was the finest pen in the world, it's too fine to actually work on that paper. So even though that paper is a smooth paper, 
it's actually too rough for the pen that I bought. It's fine for that pen. But, um, so you've just got to, um, uh, you've just got to watch, um, if you buy one of the Sailor pens, that some, some of them are very, very, very fine. But that's a really nice pen. It's a little bit like those mapping pens you might have used when you were a kid. You can get from the, um, the news agents and things like that. Uh, the, the pens that I use have a, um, a different coloured inks, and I use I use an ink called Nubla's ink. So you know, there's all sorts of different inks you can get. Uh, and I buy a cartridge, a refillable cartridge for my pens, so that I can put whatever colour ink in the pens that I want to. So I have a number of different sorts of browns and blacks that I use, and then you buy one of these little. Um, contraptions and they shove in the pens, that's what it's going on. Uh, you can buy little cartridges but they don't last too long. Whereas if you have your own bottle of ink, you can just refill your inks and pens, change them over. I have a different one of these pens for different um, purposes. And this is a Latin Safari pen. And I like these ones, there's all sorts of pens, but these are the ones I've <coughs> heavy duty, I've never broken one, you can drop them. No, I try not to drop that. Um, these cost at the pen shop in Sydney about 60 bucks. Um, you can get them online for about 20 to 25. Um, so I'll just pass that one around too. Um, yes, yeah, so the new was ink, if, you, if you're thinking of using pen and ink, it's a very, very good ink and there's a lot of different colour range. But there are there are different, you know, good good inks around. There's certain sites you can go to that talk about the permanency of, um, of these um, fountain pen inks. And so I would suggest if you're going to buy some ink and work on them, that you get something that's reasonably permanent so that after a couple of years it doesn't fade. Um, the watercolours I use are these ones. I have went through a new watercolours, um, which uh, I quite like, but I like these because they've got a bigger, a much bigger pad, much bigger, um, what do you call those things? Um, pan. Pan? Pan. pan. Um, this one, I have um, certain colours like the ultramarine blue gets used quickly and so obviously this is from another set and I've taken a new one from this one and put, it, put the old one back in here. Um, it's tricky to work out um, where to buy these, but I think um, if someone wanted to email me, I could probably give you the site that I go to, which is a Japanese site, and just press PayPal and get it in a week. So I can't read anything, I just go by the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you have a look at those. They come in a, a set that size, and then a, I think 36. Um, but 36, I think, you don't get much more, and you've got things like gold and silver and probably stuff that you've never used. Uh, over here. Um, but they're, they're fantastic because they dissolve really quickly. So with Windsor and Newton ones, you, you know, often if you get the small sets, you're sort of twiddling around and sometimes the pans are really hard to dissolve, whereas those aren't. And they're very quick. Um, you can, you know, you can have a palette nearby and mix very quickly, you get the colours out very quickly. So, so they're what I use. Um, different people have different watercolour sets there. They're happy with it, and that's absolutely fine. Um, uh, I've just found that little bit of Okay. Um, so, in relation to the work here, uh, a lot of the work has a combination of the fountain pen line, which could be the, the Lamy pen or the Fine Shimano pen, um, or um, some of them, like the two in the middle here, uh, are just pen, no watercolour. <coughs> Um, the one on the, on the right there of the oak tree is a combination of small amounts of watercolour that have probably been put on until first or last, probably last I would guess. Um, sometimes I put the watercolour down first and sometimes I put it down last depending on how I feel at the time. There's no, there's no real set method for that. Um, yeah, so it's a combination of those two things and I think every single work. Um, the, the influence on this work, I think uh, Monica mentioned at the opening, if you were at the opening, the 
the influence of uh, British romantic, uh, mainly food making. Um, and in particular, by Samuel Palmer, who was one of the early influences on my work. Um, from about 1986 onwards, I decided to produce an image, an etching, normally each year, that was a sort of homage to Samuel Palmer and a group of artists who he worked with um, who were called the Ancients. And these guys were working around 1820. Uh, they were um, fascinated by the work of William Blake, who was a very important British artist. At that time, quite neglected, as far as um, people just thought he was a crazy guy. He was an old man who was sitting up in bed, working on engravings of Dante's Inferno, which had become some of the great images made by William Blake. And that was when Samuel Palmer and a number of the other guys were introduced to him by Michael Linnell, who ended up being Palmer's father-in-law. So then Palmer produced a series of these amazing visionary drawings, which were very much in the tone of these two in the middle here. So it's good way in the same area as these two. Um, they, were, they were sepia works. Most of them now are in the, the um, Fitzwilliam Museum or the Ashmolean Museum in England. Uh, very easy to look up, but they're early drawings of Samuel Palmer. And then later on in his life, toward the end of his life, Palmer um, looks back on that period of his, his youth and makes these etchings. And these were done in the late part of his life. And he only made about 12 etchings. So <clears throat> I started to collect his work in about 1988 and have um, slowly built up a reasonable collection of Palmer's work and a large collection of British, um, British print making that somehow followed on or somehow relates to this artist's work. So the, the thing that um, I really like about this artist's work that somehow I try to get into some of these works here is this the quality of the light. There's also there's also this thing of the, the view or the sort of you know the picturesque view or the romantic view and you know, that sort of thing. And so that would be an example of the sort of the type of view I'm looking for in that sort of way. Um, it's very hard to know until you're there if you think, oh, yeah, I can do something with that. It's more, it's more saying I can do something that I think I can make that work for me. Um, the things that I really need when I'm drawing are a bit of shade, so I can sit in the shade so that my drawing <coughs> pad and my painting pad is not in the sun because it is very bright, particularly in spring. Um, and a, a, a sort of a vantage point, a view that I can see a fair distance. Uh, I find that I can somehow manage that, I can somehow make something of it. So th I guess that's the way I start. So there's a certain place of Preston I go to under Ross River, which is just south of the Sheriff's Park, that one to the right of the um, yeah, conifer tree, the Oakland tree, is an example of that particular area. And I guess we've been to that area maybe 20 times over the years. Um, but it's got a good view of the river, it's got a good view of the pinnacles and the upper part of the river going toward the weir. Um, and there's not too much grass in the foreground. Sometimes the, the weeds build up and one day of what I, um, what did he bring? He bought a sun sort of like a little symbol or something. There. I said, I don't know if you're supposed to be, you know, chopping down stuff. He said, oh, I need, need to need, need to do so. Pop was there hacking into the weeds so that he could actually get them down and see over it. Uh, but um, you probably all experienced that, uh, you know, you found a place that you're not necessarily close to work in. And uh, I like going back to it again and again and again. And in France, it, there was a couple of places that I, I worked in. One of them was at the back of the house we were staying in. And oh, maybe I should tell you a little bit about Alarak. Alarak's um, owned by a um, British couple who he bought there some 15 years ago and had no idea what they wanted to do with the place. Firstly, they, that built the house, they sort of, not built the house, but they uh, refurbished the, the old place that they were. Um, uh, they bought and took them 
four or five years to refurbish and rebuild and so on because it was all stone, white stone. And then they bought, bought the place across the road, which was a large building used as hospital uh, at the time. And they had no idea what they wanted to do with it and thought about maybe having a chef school in there. <coughs> um, then they thought, no, chefs would be too noisy and you know, we wouldn't get them to sleep and so on and so forth. And then they worked out that they liked to have artists and they liked to invite artists to go there. So over the years they've had a number of artists, maybe British artists, go there and work. And um, it's, a, it's a white stone building, uh, as a lot of the buildings are in that um, place. And the studio itself is joined onto the living area. Uh, the foundations are from about 1200 or something, it's sort of Roman foundations. Um, and the studio is quite a long building with a, a, a table, a, a 20, 30, foot, 30 foot long table along it. So it's like King Arthur and the, you know, and the Knights would sit there or something like that. So you sometimes sit at the table and because it's really long, I can sit at one end and the other artist can sit at the other end and you don't even have to talk or you can talk or whatever you want to do. A lot of the time I work outside anyway. Um, and there's a stone seat in the back of the house, and that's where a lot of these works, um, this work, this work, a lot of the works were done. There's probably 12 works in this exhibition or more, 13 works that were all done from exactly the same position on the stone seat. And I'd go down every morning at 7 and work till 11 30 when the sun would just come across my paper. And I couldn't go get the bright sun, so that would be the time to stop. And then you have a break, and then in the afternoon I'd have another spot, and at about 2 30 I'd go down there and work in the shade of the oak trees, which are these oak trees here, and work in a different direction. Or we go off somewhere and do, do a well of a, a place. So there's, a, there's the third one along there, there's Beats Woolwich, and that's a place that we, it's about half an hour away, big limestone woolwich. Sometimes go there and work. Uh, so, so you, you know, you find places that you somehow identify with. Uh, the view from the sea I like because it's I can sort of understand it and I can I can sort of work out how the fields are divided up. There's something about that landscape that I can sort of sink my teeth into. Um, there's nothing special about it in a way. Um, there's nothing more, you know, no more special than looking up the Ross River. Um, the Ross River view is probably a bit more beautiful in, in a funny sort of way. This is just a, fe a field which has stuff growing in it, usually sunflowers sometimes, or um, fallow fields. Um, we're getting at the end of the harvest, so often the fields are just ploughed. And the French plough the fields in a really quite an interesting way, which I really like. So I like the the sort of um, contour quality of that particular field uh, or set of fields and the way you can look right back in the distance and on the horizon of that field uh, is a little road so there's nothing of cars going on the top. So it's, a, it's just a, you know, it's nothing more special than the places that we go to in town so it's a little bit cooler, you know, that's probably the only thing. But one of the big differences is the, the noise. So when you're working here, you get this incredible feeling of the sort of a more raucous sounds, more loud sounds. So you get the parrots and things like that here. Whereas over there, you might get a distant, distant dog barking, or you might get a little bit of machinery harvesting the brakes on the other side of the road. But it's, it's much quieter and much, um, the light is in this harsh light. So it's a different sort of light and a different sort of sound. So I think the sound is the thing I first noticed when I started to work there more than anything else, the sort of gentleness of the sound. Um, the villages in that area are only within about 10 minutes drive from each other, uh, which would be probably a, an hour on a horse, I guess, in those days, an hour, an hour and a half horse, maximum. Well, you can probably walk them almost between one village and the next in an hour, or hardly even half an hour in some villages. So they're not they're not a long way apart, these little villages, but they're not very big. So the one we're in is seven houses. The one that I'm looking at on the far hill, you know, when that's tonic, but that's only about 15 houses. And then 
other direction you've got core, and the core of the problem will be about 2,000 years, and that's a more of a serious village. And then you've got to Toulouse. <coughs> Toulouse would be it's probably about the same size as Townsville or the in Townsville, but that's an hour away. So lots of little villages um, within, you know, not, not too far, not as far as way, you can see the village. You're almost yell across the village from where you are. Um, yeah. Does anyone want to ask a question to keep, me, keep things moving a little bit in relation to the work or the technique or the whatever? Mm -hmm. You seem to be at a vantage point where you've got a really um, heightened view. Yes. Is that the case? A heightened Your elevation. elevation. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm on, I'm on yeah. the on a hill, and a lot of the villages are built on hills. Yes, they are. Um, the, the one chord that I mentioned is Port Cecil, which is chord in the clouds. Mm -hmm. so, so you get that thing of these little tiny wall cities, the one where it is in the wall city, the wall village, uh, quite high up. And I guess that may have been for protection mm -hmm. from the oncoming enemies. Where is the street? Uh, the tree is, is outside a little uh, town in New South Wales called Oberon. And Oberon, I think, is on the one edge of the, the Blue Mountains, where the Blue Mountains finishes. Um, it's sort of due north of Canberra, north, sort of a little bit northeast of the I had to drive sort of north to get to Oberon from Canberra. It's a conifer, it's a big conifer tree. It's like a, it's like a little giant with its muscles up, I thought. Uh, it, it's on a property owned by a guy who's, um, who's building the biggest garden in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, you'll hear about this place where this tree is. Um, and we, we were there for a few days, and there's 50 people in the quarry making gardens on this place. So it's, it's open to the public on certain days, so you probably look it up and find information about it. But it's an immense man-made garden as it were. It's even got things like, you know that sort of funny pointy pot in Washington? There's one of those there. Um, there's all sorts of follies that he's built all these like little poly houses and things all dotted around the place. So it's just this extraordinary garden that looks to be about 200 acres, 300 acres. It's amazing. So just that's what I remember. Do you know that area? No. Um, yeah. Could you talk to this picture here, this avenue? It looks very um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, that is, um, that was, um, I worked with Bob Preston, he was doing a slightly different view. That's part at, Bob, Bob calls it Madden Park. Madden Park, but it's a, it's a park, um, in Mandingborough, just of these huge drain trees. Um, there's a little swing set in there, but that's all that's in there. It used to be there in the area. For the areas. Areas. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, when, I know Ralph Martin was telling me, because he lives near there, when we first went there, it was in the blue. <coughs> and, uh, and then it was gradually filled in and the rain trees were planted there and they're huge rain trees. They're only about, um, must be over about 50 years old, 50 years old. But it was very dry when we were working there. Um, but I was, again, limited in my palette, so it was only a few colours. So if I was using, I think the one I did before that, a lot more green in it. You could be very light and dry. I have. Yes, I have. Yeah. And that was a sort of decision. I thought, how, how much do I want to work on the right hand side and how far do I want to take that? So I decided to just leave it very, it's a very delicate thing on the right hand side, which I'm sort of glad I did. Yeah. No, no, I didn't. Um, never I, um, the, the problem with adding watercolour to the pen. Because the pen is not a permanent pen, because it's a, uh, it's a fountain pen, you can't get a permanent fountain pen, it 
needs in you. So if you want more of colour to be very pure and your colours to, 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 to stay pure, well then you lay the water colour down first. I don't use pencils or anything, I just lay it down. And then the pen goes over the top. But if, if I'm working on something that's more tonable, like this one, I'd certainly do the pen first. Those two over there, the colour would be done first and then the pen would be out after. But there's no particular order. Ron, <coughs> right, what's your hand? Do you use different woods in the Yeah, I do. And what size do you actually use in that? Well, the little fine, the um, fine uh, sail pen, that's, that's like an extra fine. Uh, the one I sent out, I think, is a fine, mm -hmm. and you can get that near, on the Lamy's fine, medium, and coarse. So you can get three different thickness pens, and you can just change those pens over. So I have a different. I buy a different pen, and I have a medium, a fine, and a thick. And I just pick those up and use those when I want. I don't keep changing any of this because you've got you've got to work fast because your lights change all the time. You've got to try and get this down as quick as possible. Particularly when we're working on these, these ones in on the Ross River. We, we get there at 5 and by 7.30 we're almost working in the darkness. So you really got to try and get as much as you can because your light's changing so, so quickly. So then you come back each day for three or four days and hope the weather hasn't changed. <laughs> it does sometimes. Yes? Um, when you say that the Yes. So you're just putting very, uh, once it's dry, you're very happy. Like you're not going to get a lot of time if you put the water colour over you. Mm -hmm. You will, the ink will bleed back a little bit. Even if it's dry, it will bleed back a little bit. It's, it's permanent, but it's not, um, it's not permanent as far as it's, what do you call it, the solubility of the ink. It's light fast, but it's not, it's not, it's more soluble. So it's not like a rotary ink or not like a, an Indian ink or anything like that. It does, and certain ones uh, wash back more than others. Even certain colours tend to wash back more than others. So uh, the, the nubilous black tends not to wash out as much as some of the nubilous browns. So you get one brown that washes out much more and other browns that don't. And it depends on the make of the ink or the colour of the ink. So it's what they're made from, I guess. Yeah. So it's a bit of a mystery, you know. Oh, that was down, but then you have to do more But I mean, it's all it's all a bit fun. You know, you don't you, you don't really know what the hell you're doing. You're just you know, <laughs> just working away. And, and sometimes things work, and sometimes they. I mean, I knew there was a way with that tree part before that was. I just took it too far, and you know, it was both of the nets. You know, as much as I want to scrub it back to. Their paper, it's still not going to do it. So it's still in the cover. So you have to make those calls make those sometimes and think, well, it didn't work. Um, you know, you can't, what is it? You can't flop it there to us. It's that sort of thing. It's just once it's gone, it's gone. I think. You can sometimes resurrect stuff, but not always. <laughs> Yeah, 
probably the colours aren't so much the colours that I'm looking at to do the Gartrack one, which was much stronger than that. But I kept sort of lightening it and knocking it back, so it became almost like a foggy density sort of work, like the fog. The fog had sort of the colour out. I'm trying to get the colours to sit, if that makes sense, to sit on the page well, even if they're not exactly the right colours, and then a subdued version. But yeah, it's an interesting comment, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that one. I don't see a lot of difference between one set and the other, but I'll be honest with you.